And so you okay. want to just uh, get the, uh, there you go, you're all set. You're good to go. Wait, we'll hold on a second. Uh, okay, well, let me just first of all say uh, uh, that um, I'm going to talk to you about some things that I, when I give a presentation, it depends on what level that I give the presentation as to what I'm going to concentrate on in the presentation. So if I'm going to talk about elementary school, uh, talk to elementary school level s students, then I'm going to focus on some things. And as I, as I go through this presentation, I'll talk to you about which areas I'm going to focus more on uh, based on the level. So elementary school, middle school, high school, and uh, we've we've talked to uh, Doug Milliken and I have gone to Laverne University. So uh, we will go to various schools and depending upon their knowledge, their level of understanding, their their age, uh, we'll give our presentations based on that. Okay. So now uh, I don't know what happened here. Oh, there we go. Okay. Actually, I need to go back. I don't know how I got. Because I wanted to point out. You should be able to hit the uh, left arrow on your keyboard and move back. There we go. Okay. So I just wanted to point out that uh, Scott had told us to uh, make sure that we indicate the Freedom Committee when we start our presentations. So uh, that would be the first slide I show passing the torch of liberty on to future generations. Whoops. And. Uh, Yeah, to move ahead on your slides, it's easier just to hit the uh, right arrow on the bottom of your keyboard. Yeah, that's what I'm doing, and then for some reason... Yeah, just click in there and get rid of that menu. That's what I'm trying to do. It. It's not getting out of there. Oh, that's interesting, isn't it? Okay, there we go. Okay. okay. All right. So, uh, the Freedom Committee of Orange County, I'll uh, talk about the, the passing the torch of liberty on to future generations. Then I'd like to point out the fact that we come from uh, all different branches of the service. Um, Tom will know, uh, recognize Dave Lester right in the middle of this uh, picture. And of course, we've got Jim in there and Scott and Tim and uh, Peter. Uh, Peter and, uh, uh, so uh, we talk about the different branches of the service as well as the different eras. So World War II, uh, Korea, Vietnam, uh, Persian Gulf, uh, Iraqi freedom, and so on. Uh, I do point out to the students the emblem right here, which is the uh, uh, Combat Infantryman's Badge, which is an honor to wear uh, given to those who have been in combat uh, in the Army. Uh, the oldest branch of the military, by the way, uh, founded in 1775, right? <laughs> Yeah. June 14th. <laughs> so I was a, a first lieutenant uh, in the Army, and uh, the title of this is called uh, Grunts in the Jungles of Vietnam. You guys know, uh, as um, as Army guys, we, we used to call ourselves grunts if we were in the jungle. So uh, now I was born in uh, Montebello, California, and you know, when I was really young, I used to think that the hospital, Beverly Hospital, was a big hospital. Well, it turns out it wasn't. This is a picture during the time that uh, uh, I was born uh, in uh, Montebello. Now, these, these, this picture is of Montebello, but it was before I was born. You can see those old vehicles. I wanted to point out here, though, that Montebello was known for its oil wells. And uh, things have changed a lot since... Uh, the days of 1945 to 50. Uh, my dad served in the military. Uh, this is a picture of my dad and my mom. He served in Nancy Prance during World War II. Uh, that's me sitting on a, on a basket there. We all like to show pictures of us as children so the kids can get an idea, hey, this guy was young at one time. He, you know. So that's my sister and I with my mom uh, at Easter time. And of course, some of you probably remember the the guy that would come around with the pony and uh, take pictures uh, in the neighborhoods. Uh, they don't do that anymore, but that was uh, that was me riding on the pony. And then that was me in uh, middle school. And uh, I had a paper route that I uh, uh, delivered papers for the Herald Examiner. That was my first job. Um, 
I have a copy of this uh, for anyone who wants it, if you're sharing with students uh, the different terminology of the 40s and 50s, which is different than what we have today. In fact, I, I sent out an email encouraging someone to, anyone who would want to add to the, uh, um, you know, to the uh, different terminology that we used at that time. Uh, you know, uh, we had the uh, uh, rabbit ears. Remember the rabbit ears on the televisions oh, yeah. uh, and, and the antennas on the television, <laughs> on your roof, um, and uh, candy cigarettes and uh, page boys and, and uh, beehives and all the, in like Flynn and the life of Riley. As a, as a retired E, I think of that. Uh, names of the past. Uh, uh, some of the old names that uh, my my grandmother was named Blanche and and uh, I had Lillian and Ethel and all of these old names that, uh, that we don't have today. This was me when I graduated from high school. I worked at uh, Knott's Berry Farm on the stagecoach. Fell in love with horses then, and so I I uh, worked uh, when Knott's Berry Farm didn't have fences, and uh, I. Uh, really loved that and I worked there while I was going to San Jose State University played baseball there's not a great picture but I was a pitcher for the San Jose State Spartans as well as a, a, a linebacker for the San Jose State football team uh, this is me when I went in the military now they sold me a bill of goods I was a reluctant warrior I, uh, I ah, they told ah, me ah. When I graduated from college, I was going to get drafted. They said, hey, you can go to the business end of the Army. You can go to Fort Belvoir, Virginia, and uh, uh, go to OCS there. But you have to go to basic and AIT at Fort Dix, New Jersey. So I said, okay, I'll sign up. So I signed up. Well, that was 1968. They had the 10 Offensive 1968. They were losing infantry officers right and left. So they came to us and they said, guys, sorry about this, but you're going to have to go to Fort Benning, Georgia for infantry OCS. And if you decide to drop out now, you're going to wind up in Vietnam as a grunt, a ground pounder within two weeks. So I thought, you know, be a reluctant warrior. I would wait and, uh, and bide my time with six months of training. And I figured I would have an assignment in the United States after that. So I went ahead and went to OCS and uh, got my uh, uh, second lieutenant uh, uh, commission. My Frank, you dropped out. It is my, my Frank, you hit mute. Yeah, Frank, your mic is muted. You have to unmute, you unmute, unmute your mic. There we go. happen there you okay. go you're back so anyway um so um i i went to uh, where was i <laughs> fort Ord. well within a month of being at fort Ord, i got my orders for vietnam this is me after i got out of ocs with my brother uh and this is me at the airport to go to uh from uh, tacoma washington i flew to uh, uh vietnam uh arrived in vietnam and uh I'm not going to go over this, but in case you want this information, if you have a class that doesn't have any background at all in understanding the history of Vietnam, there's uh, three different slides of the history of Vietnam that you can, uh, uh, you know, uh, share with them. So I flew into Cameron Bay, uh, the processing center there, and. Um, uh, I went into the mess hall, and this guy comes in, and he's got mud all over him. He looks like he's been through several battles, and he says, hey, can I uh, uh, join you? And this was the officer's mess hall. I said, sure. So we started talking. He says, I'm with the 1st Air Cavalry Division, and uh, uh, if you don't want to be in combat, you know, remember, I was a reluctant warrior, right? So I said, okay, uh, uh I don't want to be with the first cab, right? And he said, well, yeah, except they're really a great unit and uh, great su support, uh, the helicopter support and logistics. They're just a really, really great unit. Well, the next day, uh, this is just a map of Vietnam, but the next day, guess what? I get my orders for the 1st Air Cavalry Division. Um, now, for the, those of you that want to uh, 
go back in time and remember all the terminology that we had in the jungles of Vietnam or in Vietnam, uh, mustard, cluster F, you know what that is, cluster bombs, steel pot, trenches, uh, May West, pretty hairy, M79, which is a grenade launcher, M60 machine guns, M16, which is what I carried, and uh, uh, and most of your ground troops carry the M16 rifle. LERPs, long range reconnaissance patrol, uh, freeze dried foods. There's all kinds of different term terminology we used in Vietnam that most people don't have a clue what, what it means. But, uh, and, and the same thing for the Air Force. You've got, Air Force has got all the, all the terminology, uh, General Mall, like uh, a nice bed to sleep in at night, right? And sheets on the bed. And uh, that, that's the terminology, right? Uh, General Mall? That's correct. You got it right. <laughs> I picked the right service. Out loud. The Air Force and the Navy's got those really nice uh, cots to sleep on. Well, uh, the Army had a really nice cot, too. It was the ground, or at least the ground troops. Um, yeah. <laughs> Vietnam War te terminology, if you guys want to, uh, again, share this with, with students, uh, you can email me, and I'll send this to you. But... You know, RPGs, uh, that was the enemy's uh, RPGs uh, with the B-40 rounds, the rocket-propelled grenades, and uh, all the different terminology we used in, in Vietnam. Uh, Mama San, Papa San, uh, number, Baby, number uh, one, so on. When I, uh, when I got to Vietnam, uh, or when I actually, when I got processed, I was sent to uh, uh, Tonsonut Air Base in Saigon, and, uh, and then I uh, went over to Benoit, uh, and uh, that's the brigade, uh, excuse me, the division headquarters for First Air CAF. And they flew me out on a uh, uh, C-1, uh, excuse me, a Chinook helicopter to uh, the fire base. The fire base that I went to was LZ Grant, landing zone Grant. LZ is a landing zone. And so I went to LZ Grant, this is a picture of LZ Grant. And uh, from there, uh, I got my orders for C Company of the 1st Battalion, 12th Cav. So I went from uh, division headquarters to a fire base where our battalion was, which was the 1st Battalion of the 12th Cav. And then I was uh, get, given my orders to go to uh, the jungle where my unit, the C Company, was. Uh, one thing that I wanted to mention, and I'm sure all of you have ex experienced that that went to Vietnam, uh, when I got off the plane at uh, Tan Sanud, it was like walking into a furnace. It was so hot and humid. I mean, and then there was this kind of rotten egg mildew smell. And I thought, oh, man, am I going to have to deal with this for a year? Well, little did I know that it was going to even be worse than that. When I got out to my unit in the, in the jungle uh, and I flew by a, uh, uh, a helicopter, when I uh, a Huey helicopter, in fact, I've got, I've got a little model of one right here. Jim Jim Grimm is very familiar with this, as well as uh, uh, Sven Atkinson. Uh, they had no doors in the helicopter. I got in the middle of a helicopter. There's no seat belts. Uh, there was a pilot and a co-pilot, and in the back there was two door gunners that uh, had M60 machine guns. And uh, uh, they said, okay, we're going to take you out there. Well, they had some fun with me. They were banking at 3,000 feet, and I felt like I was going to fall out of that helicopter. And I didn't think I'd even get it out, get out to the unit in the field. Uh, but I made it, and uh, later on in, in my uh, tour, I got so used to riding helicopters that uh, I would sit on the, the we called them slicks, I'd, I'd sit on the, the edge of the helicopter, hanging my feet over uh, the skids uh, of the helicopter. and. Uh, because you wanted to get out of that helicopter as fast as possible. So the thing, is, the thing that, that happened when I got to my unit in the field is I met the company commander, I met the other platoon leaders, and it smelled so bad I couldn't figure out what is this smell. Then it dawned on me, it was body odor. It was so bad. Well, guess what? A couple of weeks later, I didn't notice it anymore because I was one of them. I went six weeks without taking a shower, so you can imagine. Well, we got uh, when we got uh, 
supplied every fourth day by helicopter. If they could bring in clean fatigues, they'd do that. But that was, uh, uh, you know, a, a, sometimes we'd get them, sometimes we wouldn't. One of the things that I did go through, uh, because they just, uh, the jungle was unforgiving, was uh, uh, boots. I went through 12 sets of boots while I was in the jungle uh, because your feet are constantly rubbing against uh, uh, jungle uh, vines and, and uh, it just wears on the boots. And plus, uh, your feet are always wet. And so you have to keep your feet wet, otherwise you'll get uh, sores on the bottom of your feet and, and you're no good if you're uh, a, uh, a soldier uh, marching in the jungle uh, without being able to walk. So I made sure my men, my platoon sergeant, I made sure that we got, when we got resupplied every fourth day, that we got dry socks. And they carried at least a couple of pairs of dry socks. Um, now this is, the, this is an example of a fire base being built because the first calf, we moved fast through the jungle. And we would get intelligence and then we would determine whether or not we should stay in that area and work trying to find the enemy or move to another area. We could build a fire base within a couple of days. And you can see they have a uh, artillery uh, piece down there, usually 105s or 155s. Uh, and we build a fire base. The battalion would, uh, uh, the troops would fill up sandbags and build uh, bunkers and build a surrounding perimeter. We put concertina wire outside of that, which is like uh, uh, barbed wire. And we put claymore mines outside of that. And uh, just before I got into country, they had a uh, uh, sappers get through the wires on the fire base. And they had to kill the, the call them gooks that time, but they had to kill the gooks inside the perimeter. We always cautioned our soldiers on guard, never fall asleep. Okay, I carried a, a, a 45 pistol as an officer, I carried 45 pistol. You know, one of the reasons why officers carried 45 pistols is you were so busy in combat, you were calling in airstrikes, you're calling in artillery, you're, you're trying to uh, move your men around according to the uh, 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 who you're getting hit by and where the where the where the fire's coming from, and at the same time you're on that radio. The idea is that you're probably not going to use your M16 unless they're right on top of you, and your best weapon to be used then would be your 45. And uh, and so that 45, I got really skilled with that 45. And the M16, to me, was a great weapon because it was very light, easy to carry. But I also caution my men that they break down quickly and easily if you don't keep them clean. And you had to constantly clean those weapons. And as long as you did and you took care of them, they were a very good weapon, comparable to the AK-47. Of course, the M60 machine gun was a machine gun that we carried in the jungle. A great, I think it's a great weapon. And... Uh, uh, I still am in contact with one one of my M60 machine gunners. Uh, yeah. What's that? Can you hear me? Everything okay? Um, Cal 50. Anybody who's not uh, participating, please mute your mic. Cal 50 uh, machine gun was on the fire base. Uh, we had those on the fire base. One time they asked us to take a Cal 50 into the jungle with us, humping through the jungle. Are you kidding me? We carried it for three days, and uh, you know the, uh, those of you who know the Cal 50. The the ammunition alone is so heavy, you know, in the ammo boxes that it was it was absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. And I said after three days, I said no more. That's it. You know, I wore down a couple of guys uh, carrying that Cal 50. Great weapon, but it belongs on a fire base, not in the middle of the jungle. Um, all of our soldiers, uh, you know, carried everything they needed for a three-day supply. You got supply. You got supplied every fourth day. Of course, this is the steel pot. Always wore that. We didn't wear flak jackets because um, we were moving around so fast, and and we never dug foxholes. We moved through the jungle. We didn't want the enemy to know we'd been there. So what we would do is we'd set up for the night. Next morning, we clean up the place as if we never had been there. 
because we wanted to catch the enemy by surprise and we never walked down trails if we did big mistake because that's where they'd set up ham ambushes um and uh all of our water we carried, uh, you couldn't rely on any of the water that you might find. You know, they give you this example of uh, with these uh, soul survivor shows where they're catching water from the leaves of the trees. Well, let me tell you something. Leaves of the trees have bacteria. You can easily get sick from that as well as the water that's on the ground. So we did use iodine tablets if it were got the worst where you you didn't you ran out of water but uh generally we we uh uh drank uh, uh, only the only water we had was what we carried as well as our ammunition so you carried at least 60 pounds of food which was mostly sea ration cans and i mentioned earlier lerps lerps were your your uh uh like your ritz carlton meal maybe once every three days <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and you'd, so you'd have to, do, what you had to do though, you had to add water to uh, heat it up so that you could have that meal. But it was good. It was pretty good compared to the sea rations. Yeah. I'll but you see. only usually did that one time. And you'd take a sea ration can and you'd have a sterno cup. You'd poke holes in the sides with your P38 can opener and you'd drop C4 <laughs> explosive in there and light that up. And man, that would act as a great sterno cup and, and uh, heat up your, your stuff. We got orders from the rear that we couldn't use C4 in that manner anymore. And well, I told my men, you're disobeying that because that was one of the one of the nice things that we could do periodically is have a nice uh, meal. Uh, this is me right here on the, on the right side. Uh, yes, I did smoke then. Uh, we had Red Cross sent, sent us out packages and packages of, of uh, cigarettes, and it was free. And I was smoking before I got there, and uh, I was smoking two packs a day. So this was a company commander. Here were, uh, th these were two of the other lieutenants. So this was the lieutenant that uh, was, uh, in fact, he stayed in the military and actually uh, wound up at the Pentagon later on and, and passed away not too long ago. But uh, he was our mortar platoon and recon platoon. He's actually a recon platoon officer. And, uh, and then I, I was a second platoon uh, officer. So, uh, yeah, I smoked a lot. I mean, there wasn't a lot to do out there in the middle of the jungle, and you didn't talk too much because you wanted to be quiet, so you uh, uh, made sure that didn't, uh, you know, you didn't have a lot of loud conversations. Um, this is an example of a lieutenant looking at his uh, map and his RTO, Ronnie, there he is, the RTO, wearing that prick 25, right? Yeah. Uh, the radio telephone operator always next to the platoon leader. That's why platoon leader's uh, life expectancy was so bad because they, uh, uh, the enemy knew, snipers knew that the lieutenant would be right next to even if you weren't in, wearing any insignia, which we didn't do. We didn't wear any insignia, uh, but our men knew who we were. And uh, uh, I, in OCS, I'm so glad I paid attention to how to read a map because I got <laughs> hug on good at it because they drop us into areas in, in three core where I was primarily working. It's all jungle. And there were only two benchmarks, and they were the Nui Ba Ren and Nui Ba Den. Some of you might recognize those those hills where they had communication yeah. centers on them. Uh, and, and that was about the only benchmarks we had. So you had this green patch, and they say, okay, here's your coordinates. This is where you're at. And you better know where you're at. And I tell the students, I said, why do you think that's important? We don't have GPS then. We didn't have GPS then. We didn't have cell phones then. <clears throat> and we had to be able to know where we were all the time. One reason, if you came in contact with the enemy for support. Another is to provide you with your logistics, your, your meals, your food, your, your uh, ammunition every fourth day. Another is to be evacuated, to medevac, dust off, uh, wounded. And so I got really good with that compass and that map. Uh, it was a combat assault. We called them combat assaults. You didn't have doors on the sides of the helicopter I had mentioned before because we jumped out of those helicopters as fast as we could because 
very often we were uh, experiencing live fire from the tree line. And uh, so it, you call that a, uh, Wally, you call that a hot LZ, right? A uh, hot LZ, I was first off the chopper. <laughs> That's right, man. Get into that jungle. One time, one time the helicopter started to go up and the door gunner pushed me off the helicopter. And I, I hadn't did. jumped off yet. Knocked me out. I was laying oh, on the ground. My RTO, Ronnie, saved me that day. Drank oh, oh. me into the bush. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. There's a, there's a, a wow. Uh, usually when we combat assaulted, we combat assaulted in uh, a uh, line of six yeah. helicopters. Right. Uh, generally not like this, but unless you were going to actually combat assault an entire battalion, you might, you might do it this way. Uh, these, uh, uh, canisters or smoke, uh, canisters and on, uh, guess what? The RTO is carrying them here. And yeah. the reason why is because we popped smoke when we wanted the helicopter to come in and supply us or, or, or identify where we were. Uh, sometimes the enemy knew where you were and they would pop the same smoke. If it was the same color, the helicopter would go to the wrong spot. And uh, Jim Grimm knows what it looks, what like, it looks like when a helicopter crashes, don't you, Jim? You bet. Yeah? Yeah. yeah you letters from home, letters from home were really important. Every fourth day, we'd get letters from home. I felt sorry for guys that didn't get letters from home because you read that letter. 15 times before the next next supply uh, because that was your you know you, you you existed in the present you remember the the past and you lived for the future and honestly that was our that was our life uh, we were we were so happy to get these letters from home and my mom was really faithful in sending me letters all the time uh, I got malaria in uh, Vietnam and was sent to Cameron Bay. I know guys will say, hey, you didn't take the pills. Wrong. Guys get malaria that did take the pill and I took it. And I'm sitting here at the hospital in Cameron Bay with a general. Uh, he's talking to me. Uh, I lost weight. But guess what? Within two weeks, they gave me not hybrid, hydro cotton, what do they say, hydroxychloroquine. Right. It was quinine. Hydroxychloroquine yeah. includes quinine. Well, yeah. I got quinine. And when yeah. I got the quinine, it napped it out right away. I felt like I had a headache coming, you know, my head was going to explode. But guess what? Right as soon as I was uh, taken care of that way, they sent me right back to the jungle. I was right back in the jungle as a platoon leader. Um, those of you who recognize these dust offs we used to use so when we would get wounded in the jungle, we would. Uh, take bamboo poles. We'd cut up bamboo poles if we were far away from a, uh, a dust off, a medevac, and we would take a poncho and we would make our own stretchers to take the, uh, the injured or in some cases dead soldier uh, back to the medevac uh, helicopter. Uh, booby traps, uh, 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 bunkers, uh, trap doors, spider traps, all of these. This is an uh, unbelievable one because what they would do is uh, they close that and it looks like it's just the ground. And they would pop up out of those tunnels and uh, fire at you and then close the trap door. And uh, you'd never even know where they came from. Uh, and that was uh, one of the things they, they, they knew where the tunnels were, they knew where the bunker complexes were, and every time we, every time we found a bunker com, this is the Kochi, uh, Kuchi tunnels in, uh, outside of Saigon. Uh, they actually have tours of those tunnels today. This is an actual bunker I found, and inside this bunker, see the arrow, this is the entrance, and, we, and you can see how small it is, that's why we had tunnel rats. The smallest guys would go in to the uh, bunkers, uh, and uh, uh, we found a hospital underground. Uh, the enemy had already left, but we saw a lot of blood, and we figured that they'd had quite a few injuries because we'd just been in combat uh, contact with the enemy just just before this. And we take our good old C4, and we'd blow up every one of these we came across. <coughs> That's just the food. Uh, uh, my parents sent me a, uh, a tape 
a reel-to-reel tape to the jungle. Guess what? I didn't have a reel-to-reel tape machine. How was I going to play it? I <laughs> never, ever listened to that reel-to-reel tape. I, in fact, I don't even know where it is now, unfortunately. <laughs> but I never listened to it. And then I came out of the jungle, and uh, and it, uh, uh, I want to I want to go over something else because the, the elementary kids love this. Uh, they. They see these booby traps, and the first time I came in contact with the enemy, I stopped a foot from a, a booby trap hand grenade tied to a bamboo string going across my path. Eight guys in front of me were all wounded or died, and we had to medevac them out. Uh, I just said I had a higher power belief, and I believed that God was on my side. He was got my back now, and whatever happens, happens. And that was early on in my tour in Vietnam, but um, I'm going to show you pictures of actual encounters. I This is a cobra, and I came across cobras. They were hanging over the, the uh, limbs of trees as you're walking through the thick jungle. Um, monkeys, we had the monkeys, uh, a, a, I, there must have been 50 of them run through our perimeter at night, at night one time. We thought it was the enemy, because they were wearing black pajamas, right? <laughs> These monkeys. Leeches. I don't know if you ever encountered leeches, but I encountered leeches walking through a creek. One time we were walking through this creek, and all of a sudden, uh, well, everybody's going, ah, ah, on our legs, you know. And usually, you know, you're supposed to t uh, tuck your pants into your boots. But, you know, it was so hot and humid, a lot of guys didn't do that. Well, guess what? The leeches crawled up in there, and, boy, those things were really uh, uh, bad to experience. Uh, uh, of course, a mosquito. Well, I got falciparum malaria from those good old boys. They were like, they were like dive bombers in the jungle. When you're sleeping, you could, uh, if you didn't put some uh, mosquito repellent in one spot, they'd find it, wouldn't they, Wally? They sure did. Oh my God. Uh, yeah. And the thick jungle. This is not even thick compared to what it was typically. Killed, a, uh, and I tell you, I felt worse about this than uh, uh, enemy, I shouldn't say this, but <laughs> a, a tiger tripped our Claymore mine outside of our perimeter, uh -huh. and uh, he was killed. And uh, the rear echelon, uh, MFers we called them, uh, <laughs> wanted that tiger sent back for some uh, general. Uh, nothing against generals. Uh, General Mall. I just, uh, but this guy uh, went back to the rear for somebody's uh, um, maybe lampshade. I don't know what it was for, but uh, water buffalo. If you kill the water buffalo, you get fined, right? Yeah. Right. Uh, this was the North Vietnamese soldiers. Uh, we worked the Cambodian border, uh, and we did actually eventually went into Cambodia, and in 1970, May of 1970, and. The North Vietnamese Army was what we mostly encountered, uh, and they they had a network of trails coming down along the Cambodian and the Laotian border called uh, uh, the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And it was a network of trails, and that's what we worked trying to find the enemy. Of course, this is the Viet Cong, also known as the Viet Minh, and uh, they were friendly to you during the day and uh, enemies uh, at night. Uh, I didn't encounter too much of this because wherever I was, uh, that's where the enemy was. So we didn't deal too much with villages like uh, the My Lai incident uh, uh, with Lieutenant Cali. We didn't deal with that much. Jungle rot, trench foot, I told you, you better keep your feet dry. Uh, yeah. Monsoon season, six months of the year, you were wet from sweat, and, I mean uh, rain. Uh, the rest of the year, you were wet from sweat. Try to stay dry. You could never, never stay dry. Clean wet um, socks. <laughs> there's another booby trap here. Uh, you know, you wanted to get a, a souvenir, so you'd pick up a, a, a North Vietnamese flag, and guess what was underneath it? Body. A, 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 a hand grenade. And this is what's left of a, a, a booby trapped uh, flag tied to uh, uh, trees. Uh, i just tell you quickly after I left Vietnam. Uh, while I was in Vietnam, I had a soldier sailor's uh, savings, 
you guys that were in Vietnam know you couldn't spend money in Vietnam if you were in the jungle, right? You couldn't right. spend money there. So you'd keep that in your soldier savings. So uh, another lieutenant and I swore that we would go to, uh, to uh, Europe when we got out of Vietnam. And I had to serve at Fort Lewis, Washington for the last six months uh, of my service. And they knew I was going to be leaving. So you know what I was in charge of? I was in charge of 30 seamstresses who sewed and refurbished jungle fatigues. And um, the jungle fatigues, uh, I had a sergeant that was in charge of Fort Lewis, Washington. I lived in the, uh, uh, the uh, oh, what's, what's the name of the hospital there? With all the doctors and the nurses, uh, there was the best gig I could have had, six months of that. And then the colonel came and called me in well, the day I was getting ready to ETS, estimate termination of service, and he says, uh, hey, I got something for you. And I said, what? He says, you get an Army Commendation Medal. I said, what? An <laughs> Army Commendation Medal? I got one for heroism, but not, not for what? What did I do? And he said, he says, well, he says, you saved over a million dollars for to the government by refurbishing these, these jungle fatigues. I, I just couldn't believe it. So anyway, I went off to Europe. This is up in Lucerne, uh, Mount Pilatus in Europe, and traveled around for about uh, three months. And then uh, I was a college professor as, a, uh, as my career, and also I was an actor. I wanted to show you these quickly because you get a kick out of it. These are pictures that I had as an actor. Uh, look a little different, don't I? Look at that. <laughs> that, that was uh, uh, my, my hair when I let it grow. Uh, of course, it wouldn't look like that even today if I had. Uh, uh, there's my commercial pr uh, profile for commercial acting. How about, and, uh, how about? A little other other pictures and then I did uh, marching through history program where uh, we went from the Revolutionary War to the present I produced and directed that Denise knows well about that don't you and I also raised Ra Arabians I'm showing you pictures of things that might the kids might be interested wow. in of your life this was my show horse uh, Malabar Sally and I had five horses uh, five Arabians that I raised remember I told you I loved uh, horses and uh, from Knott's Berry Farm and of course I had a Harley like many of you do and uh, I had a Dino White Glide uh, and then I was encouraged to write uh, that picture that I just showed you was Ray Bradbury I don't know if you know him but he was a friend of our families and he and uh, he wrote Fahrenheit 451 he was a science right. science author he uh, was sitting there with me we were having dinner and he encouraged me to start writing because he was a, one of my dad's best friends in school when they were in school. So I wrote a book called Fear Than Wind with okay. Kevin Price, and then I wrote The Battles Over, a Vietnam soldier's poems uh, about my stories in Vietnam. And, uh, and, uh, and I moved to Big Bear in retirement, done a lot of hiking, love it up there, and, uh, and that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, any questions? Excellent. Fantastic hey, Frank, job. I, Thank you. Frank, Frank I got one uh, one acronym you might have forgotten. What's it's that? It's called FIGMO. FIGMO? Yeah. I don't remember that one. What's that? I got my orders. Yeah. What's that? Oh, you got oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> I get I get yeah. it. I get it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, for you World War Two guys, you used FUBAR. Foobar. Remember that? Fubar? Yeah, what, do you, what do you mean World War II? Well, we use it in Vietnam too, but it started in in uh, uh, World War II. Uh, we use it. Oh, in Kil Vietnam. Kilroy was here. Started in World War II. Hey, to tell you, Frank, World War One. Still use it today. <laughs> it still use it today. Oh, yeah. Well, for us Vietnam guys, we call them FNGs too. Uh, for uh, yeah, there you go. New, new guys, you know, yeah. you can imagine yeah. what those guys were. New guys. Yeah, Ramps, Ramps, as a guy in the jungle, we called the guys in the rear that were having a good time rear echelon mother, you know, letters. And, uh, <laughs> um, sorry, Eliza. <laughs> she there? I'm here, but I'm trying to figure out what FMG stands for. Yeah, well, right. you can figure out what yeah, F stands right. for. New guys. Go yeah. Google. Any, okay. Anytime there were new guys that came into your unit, they, oh, I got it. Okay. they scared you to death because they didn't know what the heck they were doing. 
I was okay. assigned them to one of my more experienced soldiers uh, to watch out for this guy and take care of him because he could kill one of us or get us killed because he didn't know what he was doing. Yeah. And, and then at the very end, there's another there's another term called short. You know what that term yeah. is? Short? Short timer. Short time. 30 days, 30 days timer. or less, you were short. And then you started short getting too, timer. too careful. And, and you were dangerous then, <laughs> too. And hey, what's your freedom bird? When you, you had uh, resupplied your uniforms, were they uh, just washed or were they brand new uniforms? The bright, bright green or the the dingy? When you got resupplied, oh no, they were uh, they were many of them were trash. They they but they were they were clean, but they weren't they were clean. clean. They were clean. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, my my point is, you always could tell an FNG with the bright, bright green uniform. That's right. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. It didn't take long for your uniform to get bad, too. Yeah, you know, get jungle rot, too. That I didn't mention to you. Jungle rot, which was... Uh, when I first got into country, I had jungle rot so bad, I couldn't get rid of it from scraping the tree line, I mean, the trees and the brush. You'd get it all infected on your arms. And uh, uh, I couldn't get rid of it. And so they tell you to take Fisohex and take a brush. You had to get the remove the scab. So you scratch off. Imagine how this feels. You're scratching off the scab. Then you'd put Fisohex on, and supposedly that would take care of it. After two weeks of that, I couldn't do it. And so they gave me antibiotics. And guess what? After that, I, I developed an immunity, and I didn't have a problem with it. Um, but... Uh, yeah, interesting things we don't think about that we went through uh, uh, in the jungles of Vietnam. I do have a seven-minute video that I I wrote. The battle's over. Uh, the war is done. The boys are home now, and, and who has won? And I had a, a musician friend of mine actually sing the words while I had a clip of uh, Vietnam. It's a seven-minute video. I probably probably don't have time to show it, but if you go on uh, YouTube and go to Frank Pangborn, The Battle's Over, and just search YouTube, The Battle's Over, uh, you can download that uh, video. And I think you'll find it to be interesting. It has a lot of uh, uh, clips of uh, Vietnam and, and helicopters and, and soldiers, and, and uh, I think you'll enjoy it if you get a chance to do that. So any questions from you guys? Oh, went fast, I know. That was excellent. Yeah, that was a great job. Great uh, job you did there, Frank. Oh my gosh. What year were you there, Frank? Oh, uh, it brought back. It brought what back. year was I there? Yeah. 69, uh, September 69 to September 70. And uh, even though it wasn't the Tet, we were still in uh, the thick of things, so. We, uh, yeah. I, uh, I was there exactly the same time, Frank. Okay. Well, you know well, what I mean. October I was, uh, I, I was I was there for 364 days, 12 hours, and six minutes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mine was 11 hours. 11 you, didn't get the se you didn't get the seconds there, General Wall. I didn't have enough room to write that much. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Yeah. When yeah. I got my Freedom Bird. I was anxious all the way until I got in that bird, that plane that was taking us home. We called it the Freedom Bird. Oh. I was anxious until we were up 30,000 feet before we let out a yell. Oh, I think you can run. Because it had already happened. Man. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I, was, I, I, was, I was kind of embarrassed on, a, on the R&R &R I took to Hawaii. I was on a, you know, I don't know what it was. It was a